uh, all for uh, being here at the uh, hearing that we're going to have today on investing in the future. R&D needs to meet America's energy and climate challenges in the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Um, <clears throat> America is a nation of innovators. From the founding fathers to the YouTube creators, our country has always cultivated entrepreneurs with an idea about the next big thing. Since World War II, the federal government has recognized that it is in the nation's interest to invest in fundamental research and development to help keep the economic engine of innovation running. Today we are confronted with challenges to our national security, our economic security and our environmental security that all stem from our over-reliance on fossil fuels. The imperative to move to a clean, renewable energy system is clear. The need for robust science to guide our way is obvious. Because of past investments in energy and climate research and development, we have the tools and technologies to begin tackling the cl climate crisis now. Energy saving technologies abound. Alternative energy sources are blooming. Wind, solar and geothermal energy sources are taking market share away from fossil fuel. Hurricane tracking and forecasting helped us prepare for the arrival of Gustav, uh, Hannah and now Ike. But in order to achieve the significant reductions in carbon dioxide necessary to avoid truly catastrophic climate change and respond to the serious impacts that we can no longer avoid, we must invest in further research and development. The United States once led the world in the development and production of renewable energy technologies, just as the U.S. once led the world in broadband technologies. After years of neglect, we are now losing these races, struggling to stay close to our competitors in Japan, Europe, and even China. The bit of truth is that we are now buying technology from abroad that in many cases was originally developed here in our own universities. In 25 years, U.S. energy R&D has fallen from 10 percent of total R&D down to 2 percent. Instead of building our R&D endowment, we have been slowly chipping away at it. This trend must be reversed. Some have argued that it is premature for the United States to adopt a domestic cap on global warming pollution because we lack the technology to achieve it. That view is wrong as a factual matter. But more fundamentally, it reflects a view of America that I don't recognize. As we have heard at numerous select committee hearings, technologies exist now that will allow us to make tremendous progress. Enacting legislation will provide a driver for the deployment of the existing technology and an incentive for the development of new technology. America is a can-do nation. We answered the call to put a man on the moon, to crack the human genome, to build a national information infrastructure. With the resources generated by a cap and invest system, we can increase our energy and climate R&D investment. Climate legislation will also send a strong signal to our most vital resource, our nation's students. As we have seen here on Capitol Hill, and today's witnesses from our top universities can attest, young people today are bursting with ideas on how to bring about the green energy revolution. When I was a student, the Soviet's launch of Sputnik made us all want to study science. The government responded with significant investments in R&D and trained the next generation of scientists and engineers. Once again, there is a threat from ab above us, the dangerous buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is time for us to respond to that threat and unleash America's creative genius on this global challenge. We heard the delegates at the Republican convention chant, drill, baby, drill. What the nation should really be chanting to our students, scientists, and engineers is dream, baby, dream. And in order to make these dreams a reality, we must increase our investment in energy and climate research and development and adopt the policies that make it clear that the green energy revolution has begun. Uh, that uh, completes the opening statement of the chair. We now turn to recognize uh, the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for uh, his opening statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, the title of this hearing is Investing in the Future R&D Needs to Meet America's Energy and Climate Challenges. And I frankly can't think of a more important hearing uh, or a more pathetic situation in the United States when I consider our R&D budget. We are investing, I think, less than one-sixth uh, trying to save the planet Earth than we did trying to get to the moon. And, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking said we should prepare to go to other planets. I'd prefer just to save this one. 
and I think we can even do it cheaper. Uh, I was, I was, uh, had some good news and bad news a couple weeks ago. Uh, went out to Golden, Colorado, and looked at the National Re Renewable Labs there, which is a great place. It was really intriguing. Saw some amazing things. Saw so two cars, two plug-in hybrid cars, uh, parked underneath about a 15 by 20 uh, PV cell array, and the two plug-in hybrids could be powered by eight hours apiece just on that you know, array that could fit on top of your rooftop. It was pretty encouraging to see the amazing thing that's going on there. But what I noted about the National Renewable Energy Lab is it was the size of about a, a small junior high school. It would, it would fit into the janitorial locker of the Pentagon, and it was sort of the focus of the nation's efforts to save the planet from, you know, potential doom due to global warming and all the security threats we have. And it really put in perspective to me how sad our R&D budget is. Just if I can hold up this uh, chart here. Let me set, is there another one here? What's the other one? Do you have the other one? I'm just showing the. This is a, a comparison of the R&D charts, where we are on, if you hold it the other way, Beth, here, that'll help. <laughs> this is a comparison of the chart showing the R&D budget for our Defense Department, showing from 1960 the spike up to about $84 billion. This is the R&D budget for, for our security uh, issues, which is obviously important. The middle chart shows our R&D budget in healthcare that's gone up from, you know, one or two and 60 up to about 28 billion dollars now and then you compare it to our entire energy budget this is uh, this 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 budget is not just for clean energy but our entire energy budget for everything dirty coal everything else it's now um, at about three and a half billion dollars uh, 20 times less than than our DOD budget and arguably the best thing we can do for our security is wean ourselves from foreign oil, and yet we have this pathetically small that has actually gone down since the mid-'80s. You can see this decline from here to here. Uh, so even though we have this triple threat, security, global warming, and job loss, we have a pathetic R&D budget. And this has to be ramped up uh, exponentially, I believe, to take advantage of the technologies that are now in pre-commercialization stage. So I think this, thank you, Beth. I think this is a very timely hearing. We have a lot of work to do, and we've got to have a source of funding for this R&D permanently. Thank you. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there has been a great deal of discussion, uh, certainly on Capitol Hill, uh, with regard to the need for uh, encouraging the utilization of renewables like uh, wind and biomass and solar. And uh, the, the tragedy, and I think my two colleagues have already mentioned, is that uh, the, uh, the, the R&D spending has been abysmal. And uh, I think one of the roles that uh, this committee uh, should play uh, is continuing to sound the alarm in addition to securing as much uh, factual information as possible. Uh, Martin Luther King in 1966 uh, said, it may well be that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transgression is not the noisiness of the so-called bad people, but the appalling science, silence of the good people. It may be that our generation may have to be, be that, uh, that our generation may have to report uh, that our generation did not do what it should do. We need to speak louder as the children of light than the children of darkness. And so I think that we must continue to uh, call out uh, what we see as a diabolical misdirection uh, of our nation. We are not spending the kind of money that we need to spend on research and development if we are, in fact, serious about saving this planet. And I am. I have uh, children, and I want all of them to have children, and, 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 and I'd like for them to have children. Uh, then I think we need to do what is necessary. There is no nation on this planet with the capability of doing what the United States can do. Uh, we are simply not doing it. So I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome the very distinguished panel here this morning uh, to discuss an issue that I feel very strongly and passionately about. Uh, I spent my entire career uh, in the new energy technology business, and I had the uh, opportunity and, and privilege of 
participating in the development of wind energy technology from its very infancy into to what it is now, a successful business. And I see that uh, as an example of the kind of opportunities that are available uh, for our young men and women who get involved and are willing to do the hard work that it takes to master these sciences. In order to inspire them, we need to be willing to spend the money here in the federal government. Uh, we've authorized uh, a doubling of R&D budgets over the next 10 years, but the appropriations aren't following those authorizations. So uh, we're not meeting from the Congress, from the United States government, we're not meeting our responsibilities. Uh, and we need to have uh, a panel of such experts to convince us to do that. So uh, please feel free to, to uh, say what needs to be said uh, inspire our young people to participate, and uh, let's get the show on the road. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. All time for opening statements has been completed. <clears throat> I would now like to recognize our first witness, Dr. Susan Hockfield, the president of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. During her time at MIT, Dr. Hockfield has encouraged collaborative work across traditional discipline boundaries in order to pioneer new areas of interdisciplinary study and keep the institute at the forefront of innovation. She has won many awards. Uh, it is our honor to have you with us here today. Uh, doctor, whenever you are ready, please begin. If you could push the button on your microphone. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey, members of the committee. Uh, on behalf of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I'm grateful for the chance to highlight the overwhelming importance of funding basic energy research. I will echo the comments of all of yours in my own. Um, as you know, since before World War II, MIT has served the nation as an honest broker on complex technical issues and also as a source of breakthrough research. In the past year, as part of the MIT Initiative on Energy, we've delivered landmark reports on coal, nuclear, and geothermal energy, which have helped inform congressional action. Our faculty is now preparing similar reports on cap and trade policy, on solar energy, on natural gas, on nuclear infrastructure and waste disposal, and overall energy technology policy, as well as continuing our pioneering work on the technologies that will help make those options real. Today, however, I'm here to talk about the research funding required to achieve an energy revolution. We all know the United States is tangled in what we call it a triple knot of difficult problems. First, we have a shaky economy that's been battered by volatile energy prices, a loss of good jobs, and threats to our global technology leadership. Second, we face a geopolitical situation weighed down by issues of energy consumption and security. And third, there's mounting evidence that global climate change is upon us. Each knot is daunting on its own, and the three are profoundly tied together. Fortunately, I believe that we have the power to loosen all of these knots at once, with a dramatic new level of federal investment in energy R&D. If one advance could transform America's prospect, it would be having a range of clean, renewable, and low-carbon energy technologies ready to power our cars, our buildings, and our industries at scale, while creating jobs and protecting the planet. If we want to own those future technologies, there is only one path, and it's research. Yet in the last several decades, federal funding for energy research has dwindled to the point of irrelevance. In 1980, 10% of federal research dollars went to energy, and today, when we really need energy answers, it's an embarrassing 2%. From 1980 to 2005, the major OECD countries also diminished their investments, but at an average of 39%. But in the U.S., our cuts were more drastic. We've reduced R&D support by 58 percent. And we cannot count on private industry to do the job either. Since 1980, research investments by U.S. energy companies paralleled the drop in public research. By 2004, corporate R&D stood at just $1.2 billion in today's dollars. And while this level might suit a cost-efficient, mature technologies around fossil fuel-based energy, it is wildly out of step with any industry that depends on innovation. Pharmaceutical companies invest 18% of their revenues in R&D. Semiconductor firms invest 16%. Even the auto industry invests 3.3%. But U.S. energy companies invest less than a quarter of 1% of revenues in R&D. With that level of investment, 
we can't expect an energy revolution. And while we would, and we do welcome a recent surge in venture funding for green technologies, the fact is that venture money flows not to revolutionary research, but to near market ready ideas, the very end of the D in R&D. What's the lesson here? It's a simple one. It's that while industry must support development and commercialization, only government can prime the pump of research. Congress funded the basic research that spawned the IT revolution and the biotech revolution. Today, to spark an energy revolution, Congress must lead again. Now, why should you or the taxpayers believe that this investment will work? It's because the same kind of research investment has paid off so spectacularly before. I could call on any number of examples, but let me just give you one. Over the past 30 years, Congress has allowed the NIH, has supported the NIH, to invest $4 per year per American in cardiac research. That investment has cut death from stroke and heart attack by 63%. Imagine the same payoff measured in electric cars, safe nuclear technology, or a smart new grid. The potential here from the economy to global security to the climate is absolutely boundless. Yet, of course, we're not the only ones to have noticed. Um, if we fail to make major strategic investments in energy research now, we will swiftly forfeit the advantage to our competitors, from China and India to Germany and Japan. Other countries have the money and the motivation, and they're chasing the technology almost as fast as we are. We must make sure in the energy technology markets of the future, we have the power to invent, produce, and sell, and not the obligation to buy. So how much should we invest in energy R&D? Let's start with how much, or frankly, how little, the federal government spends today. We saw your charts, Congressman, and I'll say, just repeat it with some numbers. The total depends on which programs you count, but recognized authorities put the number for 2006 at between 2.4 and $3.4 billion. Just to scale that for comparison, it's less than half of what our major pharmaceutical company spends on R&D every year, less than half of one company's expenditures. In today's dollars, it's about 2% of the total price of the Apollo program. A range of experts, including the business-led Council on Competitiveness, uh, reports that federal energy research must climb to three or even 10 times the current level. In my view, the nation needs to increase energy R&D sharply, moving promptly to triple the current rates, and then increasing further as DOE builds the capacity to translate basic research to the marketplace. To establish firm funding guidelines, I believe that industry, government, and universities must come together to create a detailed energy R&D roadmap. Speaking for MIT, and I know for other research universities, we would be honored to help design a strategic plan. Let me close with a short vignette. In 1940, when Germany invaded France, President Roosevelt had a visit from a man named Vannevar Bush who was then chair of the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics and was formerly vice president and dean of engineering at MIT. His message to President Roosevelt was simple. For America to win the war, it had no choice but to make aggressive, focused investments in basic science. The case was so compelling, President Roosevelt approved it in 10 minutes. From radar to the Manhattan Project, the investments and innovation that decision unleashed were the military tools that won the war. What's more, that same presidential decision launched the enduring partnership between the federal government and the nation's great research universities, a partnership that has vastly enhanced America's military capabilities and national security. It's launched many of our most important industries, produced countless medical advances, and spawned virtually all of the technologies that define our modern quality of life. Vannevar Bush's essential insight was his appreciation for the value of basic research empowering innovation. I believe that we stand on the verge of a global energy technology revolution. And the question before us is, will America lead it and reap the rewards? Or will we surrender the advantage to other countries with clearer vision? Today, 
as we face the deeply linked challenges of economic insecurity, energy insecurity, and global climate change, we should see in this little bit of history a profoundly hopeful, practical path to America's future through rapid, sustained, broad-based, and intensive investment in basic energy research. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hockfield, uh, very, very much. Uh, our next witness is uh, Dr. Stephen Forrest, who is the Vice President for Research at the University of Michigan. He is a physicist by uh, training. He's made many important contributions in the area of communications, semiconductors, and more recently, highly efficient lighting appliances. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey. Transforming our fossil fuel economy into one based on renewable carbon. Can you move the microphone in a little sure. bit closer? Please? Transforming our fossil fuel economy into one based on renewable carbon free solutions is a national priority of the highest magnitude. Solutions to this problem are not simple, and there is no single path to, uh, to energy security, reduce carbon emissions, and low energy costs. Nevertheless, America's research universities homes to the highest risk, of inno uh, highest risk innovation and discovery are ready and eager to join in a partnership with government and industry to solve what is the largest single problem confronting us in the 21st century. Unfortunately, the U.S. has not responded proportionately to the magnitude of the crisis. Today, alternative energy research is only 0.02 percent of our GDP in comparison, for example, to Japan, where it is four times that amount. In fact, only 1.6 percent of all federal R&D goes to energy research. To put this in perspective, the past five years of the DOE budget, which includes money that goes for the, largest, for the large network of national labs, has averaged $8.9 billion, compared to $28.1 billion for the NIH and $73.5 billion for defense. This is remarkable, considering that the immense U.S. energy industry, a nearly $2 trillion industry, is bigger than either health or defense. Given how underfunded we are at present and how unprepared we are to meet the urgent challenges facing us, we can only conclude that Federal investments are not nearly enough. DOE itself has been crucial to advancing energy research. Its network of national labs has long guided energy research to our nation's immense benefit. And initiatives like, for example, DOE's solid state lighting program, which supports both industry and academia already has produced successes that will soon make the very inefficient incandescent bulb obsolete for interior lighting. However, to face today's crisis, DOE's programs must be enlarged to include new initiatives that encourage collaboration and truly promote the transformation of our energy economy. It will take more than just increased funding. We also need better policy to make it easier and more efficient to collaborate across these sectors, to make collaboration both streamlined and nimble. Even Michigan, with a manufacturing economy under siege, can show what great opportunities we have before us. Innovative partnerships between universities, government, and industry are showing a clear path to a win-win situation. We can come up with energy solutions and strengthen economies. Michigan and the Great Lakes regional economies are rooted in the heavy manufacturing uh, base that fueled America's greatness in the last century. We now can build on that to find new answers to our new energy challenges. Look at the auto industry, for example, where fuel costs and carbon emissions dictate that the automobile must be reinvented. Internal combustion engines will give way to cars powered by electricity and hydrogen. This change will not only solve energy problems, it will also spawn new business and a new economy. My home state already is moving ahead to change our economic base to one focused on knowledge and, en and energy industries. The Governor's Centers of Energy Excellence matches companies, universities, and training facilities so research innovations can make it to the market. Therefore, to augment DOE's expertise and strengthen the drive for alternative energy, we must make two policy changes. Fully fund the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy, or ARPA-E, and establish a network of discovery and innovation institutes. Last year, Congress established ARPA-E, an independent agency at DOE, to serve as a critical bridge between universities that are the incubators of new ideas and companies. Establishing ARPA-E is truly a milestone, but we must move quickly to fund it to the recommended level of $300 million. 
We have already lost too much time in our race to create a secure and clean energy future. Discovery and innovation institutes, recommended by the National Academy of Engineering, represent a second way to address multidisciplinary energy challenges. DIIs bring federal agencies, research universities, and industry together as collaborative R&D labs. DIIs will be regional, ensuring that they will draw on local strengths to work in a system that seamlessly spans from basic science to commercialization. And since it takes more than just science and innovation to build a sustainable energy infrastructure, DIIs can also be equipped to address socioeconomic and policy issues. This approach can provide unique training grounds for the next generation of technologists and leaders. So the time to act decisively is upon us. Our national security, the sustained health of the economy, and our environment depend on our success in this mission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farris, very much. And I would now like to uh, recognize our next witness, who, uh, who is uh, Dr. Daniel Kamen. He is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and the director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory. Uh, his work focuses on the analysis of national and international energy uh, policy. He is a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, climate change, uh, and he has been working closely with the State of California as they implement their groundbreaking uh, climate legislation, AB uh, 32. We welcome you, Dr. Kamen. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much. It's an honor to speak, and I do have some slides if they could be uh, they could be put up. Um, first of all, it's an honor to appear before this committee. I'm I can't think of a more vital task, and I'm delighted at the attention and the innovative approaches that the, that the committee has has been working on. I'd like just to start with a few key findings and then move from there into some of the details of what has taken place and what has not taken place in our crafting a national energy plan. The first and perhaps most troubling finding is that the global rate of decarbonization of the economy, which had been progressing at about 1 percent per year for the past three decades, over the last eight years has now stalled. In fact, we've seen a flat line in the sense that the global economy has not been improving in its ability to generate dollars of GNP and G gross world product without uh, producing carbon. This is a critical issue, and the lead economies must take a, a role in, in reversing this trend if we have any hope of meeting our climate goals. That's a vital first part of the story. The second piece is that public money alone will not solve and won't even begin to solve the climate problem. But pardoning, pardoning the, uh, uh, the analogy, it's vital that the public sector prime the pump in this area. There's a number of features, both in terms of the actual dollars spent and their impact on the private sector, for which we have a great deal of data, that if the public sector does not play a major role in this area, the private sector cannot move ahead in the ways it needs to, 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 to do. There are powerful examples. We've already heard about the story in the, in the national health field where a concerted effort, a planned effort to double the federal NIH budget over about a decade resulted in a far larger increase in private sector investment. In fact, while public sector monies doubled, the stability and the path demonstrated resulted in a factor of 11 to 12 increase in the private sector money. We have not seen any plan comparable to that in the energy field. In fact, a colleague of mine noted that what this means is that we'll likely live long enough to see the error of our ways. So a vital issue has, has, has been left before us. In the semiconductor field, when the United States was demonstrably trailing Japan, a coordinated public-private sector effort resulted in Sematech that charted a new course and, in fact, led to a whole range of innovations, so powerful, in fact, that the public money was effectively no longer needed. And this carried through as a private sector effort with a range of innovations. It's been a vital part of the overall story. The key, the key message in this is that without a plan, without a plan that coordinates energy efforts and ties it to our climate needs, it is impossible for even a set of well-crafted individual programs to get us where we want to go. No matter how good a job one does in a particular effort on a subset of nuclear or solar or biofuel technology, without that vision, it's impossible to carry these things through in times of budget stress and in crises when money is needed for other areas. That is the single most critical part of the story, and that's why it's so critical to the bill you proposed 
and versions go forward that lays out a climate plan and ties the energy um, investments to it. We've already heard about how critically small the energy investment has been uh, as a part of our overall economy. And in fact, the energy field is investing at roughly one-tenth the average rate of reinvestment of revenues back into research of the economy overall. And as, um, as, as President um, has already mentioned, we've already seen far higher levels in biotech and other areas where investments at 10 to 15 percent of total revenues have been put back in some of the areas in biotech. This is the sort of investment that's possible in the energy area. And in fact, this is the sort of investment that's critical in the energy area to meet the goals ahead of us. We have a number of key things that can be done relatively quickly. Right now, we have a relatively poor program to transfer technologies from our national labs and from some universities into the public sector. We've had times in the past where various arrangements like CRADAs have been successful in bringing these technologies to the market, and we need to unleash that potential again. We also have a wide range of international initiatives where the United States could profitably partner, both in terms of technology research and development sharing and in outreach and, dem and dissemination. There are important opportunities for the U.S. and India, the U.S. and China, the United States and Europe to move ahead. And in fact, the most compelling message you hear when talking to European leaders is how critical it is for the United States to re-engage and to reap the lion's share of the benefits in this area. This is not a selfish endeavor. This is one where we critically must see those investments. And I'll, I'll highlight one item on this final slide. And this shows the um, composite aggregate growth rates in investment in clean energy when you look at Europe, North America, and Asia. It's notable not only that we are seeing high rates in other parts of the world, but in fact, the rates of increase in Europe and in Asia are far outstripping the current investment rates in the United States. This is a shame, and this is bad for our economy. We see the world's largest wind company in Denmark, a country of five million. The next Google of wind, of solar, of fuel cells should all be U.S. companies. We actually have the technology innovation centers, Silicon Valley, Route 128, the Austin area, um, areas evolving into, in the Detroit area right now, all primed to do this. But without that strong federal signal that public monies and public investment and universities will focus on these areas, you send a very mixed message to industry that we will move ahead in these areas. So I urge us to use as the basic part of this equation the need to push dramatically ahead on funding, as all of us, I believe, are advocating for, but also to set the critical policy environment where a price for pollution will be part of the equation, where efforts will be targeted at lowest cost programs, not at pet programs, and a program where the federal government will take the lead by beginning to do carbon-based cost effectiveness analysis of federal programs, both on the research side and on the deployment side. And it's vital to link those two parts of the equation. While the Van of our Bush story is an awesomely powerful one, and we cite it for good reason in many situations, the immediacy of climate change now dictates that we highlight equally the R&D side and the deployment side. If we don't focus on both, it will be impossible to achieve our climate goals. Thank you very much for the chance to address the committee, and I look forward to the question and answer period. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamen, very much. And our final witness is uh, Dr. Jack Fellows. He's Vice President at the University Corporation for Atmospheric uh, Research. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, worked in the White House Office of Management and Budget, where he oversaw the budget and policy issues related to NASA, NSF, federal-wide uh, R&D programs, and helped initiate the U.S. Global Change Research uh, Program. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. I'd like to thank the committee uh, for this opportunity to testify today also. And I, I commend the committee for your tireless efforts on this important topic, including, Chairman Markey, your introduction of the recent ICAP legislation. Uh, as you said, my name is Jack Fellows. I'm a vice president of a nonprofit consortium of over 70 universities that are very interested in this hearing. Uh, every member of the committee actually has one of my university members either in your state or in your district. Uh, I, 
I'll respond to the steering committee questions in just a minute, but I want to emphasize that my responses are based on a community document that provides advice to the next administration in Congress on making our nation resilient to severe weather and climate change. It was created by eight organizations that represent thousands of experts in the public, private, and academic weather and climate enterprise, and I've submitted that document as part of my testimony. Our 50 states are battered, battered by billions of dollars of weather and climate-related damages and losses each year, and it isn't clear how these impacts are going to change as the climate changes. And I'm talking about floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, drought, sea level change. And adapting to these changes will be crucial for economic and social stability, in particular making water, food, and energy supplies reliable and sustainable into the future. Our country has made substantial investments to improve weather and climate tools and information, and we've made tremendous progress over the last 40 years. We're very grateful for this support, but due to the complexity of this problem and years of declining budgets, these community partners who wrote this document are concerned that our nation does not have all the tools we need for an effective energy and climate strategy in particular one that helps local and regional decision makers deal with climate change, one that supports the implementation of carbon emissions reductions proposals like ICAP, and one that helps actually build a prosperous carbon-free economy, including making forecasts for green industries like wind and solar. Our ability to provide the right scale and type of information in these areas is hampered by the lack of key observations, computing, research and modeling, and effective coordination. Regardless, a lot of local and regional decision makers are moving forward with inadequate information in the face of substantial climate feedback uncertainties that may prove very costly to civilization. For example, how quickly the polar ice caps are actually melting. And given the urgency of the situation, the community partners have actually provided this document to the Obama and McCain campaigns and also collected nominations for weather and climate positions in the next administration. But let me address the questions that the committee gave me. The first one was, what are the current Earth observing and climate modeling investments and how do they compare to the past and with other countries? And there's really no effective inventory of these activities in the U.S. right now. That's one of the recommendations of the community document is to create that kind of inventory. There is something called the Climate Change Science Program that provides the best estimates that we have. This is a program that involves 13 federal agencies and we hope has uh, about $1.9 billion appropriated in 2009. In my testimony, I actually provided a funding history of the Climate Change Science Program, but a brief summary the funding is roughly back to where it was in the early 1990s. So whatever gains we've made over the last couple of decades, we've, we've lost. I'm not familiar with the current funding in other countries right now, but in the past it's been roughly equivalent to the U.S. investment. The other question you ask is, what investments are needed to meet our energy and climate challenges now? These community partners are making recommendations in the areas of observation, computing, research modeling, societal relevance, and leadership and management. And in that document, it includes a budget table with specific program and budget estimates that total $9 billion over the next five years, well within the kind of 7 to $9 billion that the ICAP legislation is trying to raise for domestic uh, climate adaptation activities each year. The third and fourth question I was asked is what policies are needed to optimize these investments and what should be the private, public, and academic roles in this effort? The community partners provide an entire section in our document on leadership and management recommendations and how these three sectors ought to work together. Leadership will be a key ingredient to optimize these investments and that's why the community partners are actually collecting nominations for leadership positions in the next administration. This section also includes a set of policy and management approaches that build on proven management tools that were available in the 1990s. Uh, and that includes a climate leader with, with the, at a level equivalent to the president's national security and economic advisors, an effective interagency coordination and oversight mechanism, an annual integrated weather and climate program and budget review, and evaluation mechanisms to make sure that we're making progress toward our goal. 
Uh, that concludes my remarks, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, doc thank you, uh, Dr. Fellows, very much. The chair will now recognize himself for a round of uh, questions. Um, Dr. Kamen, do you believe that we have adequate technologies to begin reducing global warming pollution now, even as we increase our investment in R&D in the years ahead? I do very strongly believe that we have an adequate base to begin. We clearly have areas where we need research, a number of individual technologies, <clears throat> on the balance between investing in efficiency now and some of the low carbon technologies in the long run, but as a, as a platform to begin that process today in the economy, that base exists, and yet we need to bring much more of it to market than has been the case in the past. I mean, Dr. Hockfield, could you respond to the same question? Do we have adequate technologies today to make a significant beginning? We, we have adequate technologies to make a significant beginning. What we feel is that we have important things we can do in the near term, but in the midterm and the long term, we've got to invest aggressively to improve those technologies, to make them more economic, <clears throat> excuse me, more economic and more efficient. But we certainly can begin today, and I think we have to start today. Uh, let me ask you this, Dr. Highfield. What, what is the interest level of students at MIT? in yeah, the, this issue. The interest level is deafening. Just as one example, our students are you know, wildly enthusiastic about it. We can't you know, give them enough. We have a student-led energy club that was established um, just three years ago and now has over 700 members. This is largely a graduate student organization. And it was established by graduate students across all of the different schools at MIT who recognize that in their desire to be energy professionals, they're committed to working in the field, that their education that they were receiving in the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering or in their MBA program at the Sloan School of Management was insufficient to make them well-educated energy professionals. And so they've linked resources across the entire institute to educate one another about all of the things they'll need to be powerful advocates and powerful uh, facilitators of a bright energy future. Um, the students' interest is absolutely deafening, and one of my fears is that if we don't fund the kind of research that will fuel innovation, these very brilliant students will see that um, a bright future actually lies elsewhere, even despite their passion for solving what I believe is the greatest challenge of our era. Uh, thank you, Dr. Highfield. Um, it Let's talk a little bit about the R&D budget in terms of how it uh, compares to uh, uh, past R&D uh, budgets and uh, just kind of get your sense across the board of what needs to happen. It, 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 does it need to be increased from a, a doubling to a tenfold increase in order to deal with the magnitude of this challenge? Could each well, of you give us a sense of what you believe is the most appropriate? If yes. I can jump in, um, I'd like to go back one step and talk about cli climate change and energy and then get, and if I may, then go to that other question. But the issue of uh, do we have enough tools for climate change and pursue energy at the same time, I think is a, is a vital one. It's not an either or proposition. We have to take them both on. We do have the tools. And the, the best analogy I can give was in the Second World War, we didn't have a choice to say, will we go after Germany or Japan? It was both. And that's the same situation we have today. In terms of the budget, uh, I think the overwhelming opinion of this panel, I can certainly speak for myself, is that we are woefully underfunded. So if we talk about um, a 10 times increase, yes, but we have to also build the capacity. So you can't do it overnight. Uh, we have a very large reservoir of student interest, as President Hockfield has mentioned. Um, and I think that we just have to really get on with it right away and start to fund some of these institutes, ARPA-E, for example, and just start moving up that chain as rapidly as we can. But certainly, I think the numbers would justify a tenfold increase. So the NIH budget is uh, approximately $30 billion a year, research yes. on um, health problems. Is that the scale that you think we should be talking about, Dr. Hawkins? Yes. I mean, the, the, certainly the, uh, the, the level of uh, intensity of the problem is every bit as much as what we're tackling with health. And we're, when we really cut the numbers for the DOE right down to what's going into science, it's about one and a half billion dollars. Dr. Hockfield, do you agree that's well, the scale? Whether it's one and a half or four and a half billion, it's vastly insufficient. And um, I think you've drawn the comparison that I immediately go to as a life scientist. 
um, which is a comparison with the NIH budget. The NIH budget is close to $30 billion, and that's a lot of money, but we have gotten a huge bang for that buck. Just think about it. I gave the example of heart disease and, and, and stroke. Look at AIDS. Um, in the beginning of the 1980s, uh, this was a disease that had no cure. It was a death sentence, and we projected that every hospital bed in America was going to have an AIDS patient in it. This is a very tough problem, a new disease. We didn't understand anything about it. We've turned it through investments into a chronic manageable disease that costs the healthcare savings are 140 times the investment in research dollars, and that doesn't even begin to account for the economic benefit of these people being in the workplace. We can do the same thing around energy. Um, and it will fuel, if, you know, federal investments can fuel an innovation economy that will be good for everyone. Now, we talk about how much money, you know, I say three times right now, let's do that immediately. And whether it's 10 times, you know, over a, a 10 year period or gets to the NIH budget level, I think it has to. These are problems that we can solve, and we know how to solve them. And it'll have the added benefit of, uh, you know, fueling the young people of America. Right now, we kind of wring our hands over our young people's lack of interest in science and engineering and mathematics. Well, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't that I had an abstract interest in these things. I had a real interest in these things because we were going to win the race to the moon. And I think we could power up our young people today with the same kind of enthusiasm for solving these energy and climate challenges. Um, not to mention the building of new industries that would come out of it, as we've demonstrated so many times in the past. This is America's game. We should be able to win it this time. Thank you, Dr. Hockfield. I and I just that my, just my time is going to expire. I, I apologize to you, uh, Dr. Cameron, but uh, there has been, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, a 16 percent reduction in the NIH budget over the last four years as well. So we really do have to change the whole approach that America is taking, not only to energy but health and other issues, because these are the real threats. Um, to ordinary American families, much greater actually than the likelihood that a terrorist will come to their hometown. These are the issues that are actually going to impact their family's future. My time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. I'd like to ask about how to structure uh, this imminent exponential increase in R&D that we will imminently obtain maybe in March next year, I hope. Um, one of the concerns I have is structuring it so that R&D goes into stovepipes into favorite programs, which is a, a thing we want to, I think we want to resist. And I'd just like your comments. Maybe I can start with Dr. Kamen about that. We're, we're debating an issue right now, frankly, about whether to create a revenue stream that would fund just R&D just in coal sequestration, which I have heartburn about because I don't think we should limit R&D to any one particular technology. We should have a broad-based uh, recognition that some of these technologies will succeed and some of them will fail, and we should not put our eggs in any one basket. Just wonder, maybe uh, Dr. Cameron, do you have any comments? I very much appreciate the uh, chance to, to address that because this is a, this is a very critical issue. Uh, the lessons from the NIH budget increase were that you did need to ramp it up in a place in, in a way that industry and, and universities could absorb it. Um, our kind of unit of our, our time constant in, in academia is actually about four to five years for a doctoral student to come to fruition. And then in the industry side, it's actually often another four or five years for those to become technologies in the market. So this tripling is a good starting point. In our papers, we actually advocate a factor of five to ten mm -hmm. increase based on the climate challenge. But this issue of stovepiping is a vital one. And in fact, we've had a series of interesting individual program areas in Department of Energy, at EPA, et cetera, but we have not had the kind of cross-technology comparisons that you are speaking towards. And by far the most effective tool we have now is to examine technologies in batches. There are things that are nearer term where a carbon cost effectiveness can be performed, but there are also areas which are further off, higher payoff, high risk, where we are going to need to have some areas where we look at with longer term missions. The most important lesson we've seen from past efforts is that for both the near term and for the longer term ones, stability and a plan is the most important feature. The private sector cannot ramp up in the broad set of areas we need if we don't see that stability. So the long term budget uh, 
increase as part of the story, and targeting individual ones early on, especially those that already have a large market share, has not proven to be an effective use of money in the past. And so targeting money in a coal area is a concern, as it would be in targeting a number of others. And so I urge the committee to look at this broad portfolio approach and to use that to evaluate not only individual technologies, but those that have critical synergies. We've seen efforts where wind and natural gas can work well together, and so um, structuring incentive, incentives on the deployment side to draw those technologies into the market is critical as well. And so again, pushing on the policy and this research base at the same time is the best way to bring these technologies broadly into the market and to re-energize a number of U.S. firms to become leaders in these areas. Dr. Rockfield, do you want to? Yeah, I think um, I want to uh, emphasize this idea of approaching a portfolio of, of technologies. We can't choose winners now. We don't know what they're going to be. And we have to invest money in, you know, in a number of technologies. One of the problems is this kind of research is done across a number of federal agencies. And so how can we bring them together to get appropriate synergies and uh, reduce um, unnecessary redundancy? Um, I think it's important to enter into a very rapid strategic planning exercise that pulls in government, industry, and universities to set out a, a, a game plan. And um, I hope that there will be some kind of uh, federal council around these energy issues, bringing in the relevant uh, agencies, uh, not just DOE, but DOD, NIH, NSF, uh, EPA, HUD, you know, around building uh, standards. And I don't know who might chair this council of, of secretaries, but perhaps it could be co-chaired by the President's Science Advisor and the Secretary of Energy, but some way of integrating the approaches across, not just within a single agency, but across agencies. I, I think, think that's important. We'll think about it. Wait, one quick question. To get to this plateau where we need to do this major ramp up of R&D, it takes some political throw weight. We got some great ideas floating around here, but we need some political throw weight, frankly, to get Congress and the executive branch. We need. A, a new, we need a combination of Vannevar, a new Vannevar Bush having these comments with the next president and members of Congress, but we need a lot of people around here. I just wonder if any, maybe Dr. Fowles, do you have any thoughts about how to develop a, a real consortium, you know, nationally between academia and the industry and, you know, how, how do we build a real movement to get this job done, as happened in the healthcare industry that really developed a, a uniform, you know, uh, strategy to get this job done? Well, you know, it's happening at various scales. The rest of my day, I'm spinning up here on the Hill with the American Geophysical Union on a congressional visit today to, t to talk about these various issues. But the, the document that I mentioned in my testimony was written by these eight organizations that represents thousands of experts in both the public, private, and academic uh, sectors of the weather and climate community. So it is starting to happen. And we're writing these documents and providing them to, to leaders like yourselves to try to, to build these coalitions. In, uh, in, in our community, we have about 20 years of multiple agencies working together. And there is some good history here on how, how these kind of integrated programs can be done. But leadership is key. And, and getting the right leaders and the right kind of political focus on here is step one. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. <clears throat> Unlike uh, President Kennedy, who had Jerome Wiesner became president of MIT, or President Roosevelt, who had uh, Professor Bush come in, it's, it's unclear that uh, this President Bush uh, knows the name of, much less has ever met with, his own science advisor. So uh, there is a stark difference historically in terms of their relationship with this subject. Let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from uh, Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Hockfield, may, may, you may have already um, at least partially answered this, this question, but I'm wondering what are the most important emerging technologies uh, of which uh, we can, should be aware and uh, what are ways in which we can best support uh, these efforts? Uh, the incredibly uh, accelerating demand on, for energy. It's great now. It will probably double by 2050. Uh, demands that we pursue a portfolio of technologies. Um, the current technologies that we're using are not going to, you know, go out of phase tomorrow, and we have to work very hard to increase their efficiency and their economy while we develop the technologies of the future. 
Uh, we have work going on at MIT across a range of technologies. We believe that nuclear is going to be an important piece of the energy equation in the future. Um, we're very, very um, excited about the opportunities around solar, wind, uh, geothermal, uh, a technology that was about to be put to bed, except for the MIT geothermal report came out uh, about a year and a half ago, and happily rescued that at the last moment. There are a number of technologies, and frankly, I believe they're technology we don't even know about today because we haven't unleashed that engine of innovation uh, that comes out of basic research. So I don't think we can make bets yet. Um, there are enormously exciting things right on the horizon. There are exciting things in hand that just need further development. But um, it would be you know, uh, desperately premature to pick any one or a small set of them for development. We're going to need everything we can get our hands on. Uh, the current technologies have to be improved, and then we have to innovate around the technologies of the future. If I could jump in on that. Um, if you look at what is price competitive today with fossil fuel, uh, in, a, in the renewable sphere, the, the most competitive is wind. Um, but the, uh, the source of energy which is unlimited out there is solar. And the thing that's holding us back from solar <clears throat> right now is cost. It's the cost per watt that you pay, which is, um, depends on, on how you do it, it's between double and triple that of fossil fuel today. But it's marching down at an, at an extraordinary rate. So if you look at solar, you look at biomass, you look at energy storage, which will transform the automotive industry, um, you have several really strong incumbents that we can move forward with. Uh, it's really just a matter of hitting price points at this point. Can I just add in this thing about storage? Storage is absolutely, absolutely critical for almost all alternative energy technologies. And you know, solar, the price of photovoltaics may come down, but if we don't have our heads, hands around storage, that's going to be a problem. And one of the most exciting you know, areas that I, you know, that, that I see going on is new battery technologies. And it will be the cars of the future, actually, in not such distant future, but it's going to be critical to make solar and wind viable technologies. Dr. Kamen. There are also technology areas that bring in other areas of expertise. Right now, there's no question that storage is important. There are some interesting efforts going on in this area, but the basic backbone of this whole system is going to be our transmission distribution system. And many universities have allowed this area to lapse, so there are, in fact, no power electronics professors at a number of leading engineering universities. And that's a huge oversight, and it's a huge mistake, because our renewable energy resources are not always coincident where the grid exists today. So what can we do? What can Congress do? Well, there's a range of things. One is we need better coordination with what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission does. We also need ties into what the National Academy of Engineering does because the advances in power electronics coming from work in a variety of areas, from everything from what's going on in our cell phones to power management issues, need to be applied to make the new grid that we are going to build in some form anyway as flexible and as smart as possible so that it really becomes the clean energy superhighway and not yet uh, just a, another build out of, of what we have as right now quite an antiquated system. That one requires an integration with people who think of themselves as energy researchers and those people who think of themselves as electrical engineering and controls folks. And thankfully, this country has a large resource there, few of which, however, have been applied right now to working on that new grid. And so this is, again, an area where Basic research and the, and the application deployment are tied. Texas had a historic recent vote uh, to, uh, to, to, to permit and to fund a $5 billion superhighway for wind power, essentially from West Texas and Eastern um, New Mexico into the population centers. And that sends a strong signal. We need to get the basic research so that the new version of the grid is up to the task. Mm -hmm. So it would help probably if we had an em environmental protection agency. It would definitely help if we were protecting the environment and coordinating those efforts in what we do in terms of lands, in terms of Department of Energy, and in terms of a lot of the basic infrastructure, even building and housing is going to be tied in because many of our homes and businesses can, in fact, be power plants. And so well, that I'm going to introduce a bill to, to create a, an EPA because I think that this country is, has, has long needed an environmental protection agency, and I think such legislation should come forth in this Congress. Uh, Dr. Fellows? Well, I wanted to add a perspective from the climate community on priorities. Our current climate models reproduce the history of the climate quite well, and we can tell you whether a continent is warmer or wetter. But I recently had the executive director of the Colorado Public Health and Environment Department come and visit, and he asked me for the precipitation and temperature trends long term in the Denver area. 
And our models are operating on grid cell size of 100 kilometers. At that level, you can't even see the Rocky Mountains. So I can't provide him those kind of long-term precipitation and temperature trends in such a small area. So uh, one of our highest priority er areas is to drive down that modeling to a level that local and regional decision makers can actually get the information they need to have to make plans about water, food, transportation system, things like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hockfield, I'd like to get an idea. I mean, you're asking for a fairly large amount of money. How you see that money being allocated? Uh, and one of the reasons I ask is because a concern I have is uh, young students that want to go to graduate school have to spend uh, five, six years after getting a degree, uh, and they're living at fairly low wages during this period. Uh, and even when they graduate uh, with a PhD, they're still facing years of substandard wages compared to someone who just went from a bachelor's degree uh, into finance, for example. Uh, one of the uh, experiences I had lately was uh, a math professor said, oh, there's plenty of math students now. There's more than you can imagine. And that was the good news. But then he said they're all going to finance, which is not bad news, but it's not what we need in this area. So uh, could, could you give me some uh, idea of of how you think we could address that and similar problems? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, we, I hate you know I hate that we all sound like a broken record. Research dollars, research dollars, research dollars. But um, one of the you know, geniuses of the Vannevar Bush uh, appeal to President Roosevelt that was then articulated in Science: The Endless Frontier, which set out the blueprint for the American research enterprise. Um, was that we created these magnificent research universities that, at their best, really do integrate research and education together. Um, and frankly, most of my faculty, not all of them, but most of them could have jobs in industry and be making twice, three times, in some cases, ten times what they're making. Yeah. But they are so motivated by this marvelous, um, you know, draw of invention, innovation, and being around young people. We really do put research and education together. So by investing in research, we're talking about investing in graduate students. We're talking about investing in postdocs. The reason that the students in mathematics and in electrical engineering, computer science are going to Wall Street when they come out of MIT is because that's where the jobs are. When they look at their faculty, who in power electronics is a great, I'm so happy you brought that up, a, a great field. We have a couple of faculty who are working in it, but miserably funded. So a smart right. young person is looking forward to a life of what? You know, there isn't a career track that they can proceed because, um, you know, frankly, there's been a roller coaster of energy research over the last several years. It's funded, it goes away, it's funded, it goes away. These people want a career right. where they can, frankly, they'll accept, you know, lower salaries. Well, I heard some very bad news about University of California uh, in particular, the math department there, one of the finest math institutions in the world, uh, uh, is saying that next year they may not be able to accept new graduate students unless they get additional funding. So, I mean, this is a terrific tragedy for our country. We have, you know, so part of the government's abdication from the commitment that was set out in the Science the Endless Frontier Blueprint was a real partnership between the research university and government. And the government has abdicated that through these reductions in research funding. And, you know, one of the places where it hurt the most is in funding for mathematics graduate education. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it's become very, very difficult to fund graduate students at a level that is commensurate with, you know, what late 20 year olds uh, need simply to live in, in uh, at a reasonable level in a place like, you know, Cambridge or, or New York City or in the Bay Area. One, one thing that might help is specific academic programs that entice students uh, in energy fields. Um, could you address that, Dr. Kamen? Well, certainly. Actually, we had a spate of developing these programs in the 70s during the last time we had this ramp up of energy funding. My program, the Energy and Resources Group, program at MIT, Carnegie Mellon, Penn, are a number of the beneficiaries of that. A number of these died out or withered away because of this, 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 this true desert of funding. We now see students back in droves. When I came to Berkeley from Princeton in 1998, there were 45 students in the graduate level energy class. We capped the class this semester at 320. 
And I'll let you know, I have a huge problem finding qualified teaching assistants because we have so swamped the, uh, the, the, the potential spaces. So there is good news in the pipeline, as, as we've heard at MIT as well, at Michigan, at Texas, it's all going on. But we really do need to build out this business side, this opportunity for them to go into, as, as a number of people have mentioned. And Congressman Inslee mentioned the need for a compact and the, and, and the bones that could be offered out in, in, the, in the political dialogue in DC. And there's no question that one of the advantages this field is showing right now is dramatically higher job creation numbers than the same amount of investment in fossil fuels. Mm. Now, this is a transitory effect. It will not go on forever. But at the moment, we're trying to dramatically increase the budgets. The fact that we see three to five times more jobs per dollar invested in the clean tech energy area, and I'm including energy efficiency that we've not mentioned explicitly here, but it's vital to the equation. This job dividend, green collar jobs, inner city jobs, as well as the, uh, as, as the high end jobs, is a critical benefit that we can capture, and right now, Many of those jobs are going to Germany, Norway, Portugal. So we are losing out. In fact, Little Portugal just set up a clean energy research investment fund larger than the entire US investment in this area. See that my time has expired. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, without giving away our ages, I would say uh, Dr. Hockfield is probably already um, acknowledged being in the same uh, group that I'm in, which grew up during the space race. My father was uh, head of the design team that uh, built the camera that took the first live pictures from the moon when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Uh, and my brothers and I got used to having a blackboard over the breakfast table <laughs> and solving equations that he would scribble out for us while we were downing our cereal. Um, we benefited from the generation that pulled us out of the Depression, the greatest uh, generation, the end of the American century, that uh, I, second half of which I lived through, uh, the generation that won World War II. Uh, it took great determination and vision and hard work and investment uh, for that generation to win a war and for uh, uh, us to put a man on the moon. But that wasn't all. Their effort was backed up by the resources that put into place uh, an incredible investment at the time in pure research. Um, I just came back from a couple weeks ago from Denver, uh, and one of the most exciting things that may be the most exciting thing for me was not uh, the political goings on, although those were for somebody who had never attended a convention before, very exciting, but I got to go to NREL, the Renewable Energy Laboratories, to NCAR, the Atmospheric Research Center, and to NOAA's Research Center in Boulder. And in the space of two days, I saw uh, the latest plug-in hybrids, the latest uh, uh, solar thin film photovoltaics that are 23 percent efficiency, which is the high point they've achieved so far, uh, to my knowledge, uh, and biofuels that are being created from non-fuel sources like wood chips and corn stalks and husks, not the corn kernels that are the food that everybody's worried about. Um, and then the next day, after seeing the good news, I got to go to NCAR and NOAA and see what would happen to the planet if we don't do anything. And to anybody who, has the, who hasn't been there and seen this, I highly recommend it because I already have read the statistics and I'm a believer and I've been working on renewable energy issues for 30 years and it was like being hit over the head with a two by four to see the graphic demonstration of what happens when the growing latitudes for food move into the alluvial plain of Canada where there's no soil and I said to the director of NOAA, I guess we'll go from being a net import, exporter of food to being a net importer of food. And his answer was, yes, but from where? And he pushed the remote control to revolve that big globe they had up there and showed that all continents are the same color red. All the continents are pushing, will be, if we do nothing, will be pushing the growing latitudes toward the poles at the same time that we're projected to have 12 billion people on the face of this earth. So, we're looking at a situation that cannot be dismissed. But the good news is that at the same time, we do have the technologies and uh, we need to make the right choices. Uh, Mr. Inslee covered some of the ground uh, uh, that I was going to ask about in terms of making choices in stove piping, piping. And I'm particularly interested that we not favor uh, some industries as we do. I mean, there are costs that are not included in the kilowatt hour price that are charged for electricity generated 
from nuclear and from fossil fuels, uh, whether they be the costs of wars in areas, uh, uh, unstable areas of the world that have oil, or the fact that the taxpayer has subsidized the insuring of all uh, nuclear plants since the Price-Anderson Act. Um, and so I would prefer to see either a level playing field or some kind of equal subsidies for renewables, but that's uh, just my opinion. I am also concerned that uh, I have been buying wind power in my home in Dover Plains, New York, uh, for several years. Uh, the company, the uh, wind farm that I am buying it from was just bought by the Spanish conglomerate Iberdrola. Good company, but not an American company. So now my dollars are going uh, for the profit of a foreign-owned uh, corporation. And when I was in Colorado, I saw uh, one of the largest new photovoltaic installations there built and installed by American workers, but the solar cells were made in China. So if we go from buying fuel from overseas to buying solar cells from overseas, we are really out of the frying pan and into the fire economically. Um, and we are also not putting our brain power to work uh, in the way that we should. Uh, that is enough rambling uh, from me, but I just wanted to ask, uh, in terms of funding climate observation uh, to the degree that we have a shortage of funds here, uh, we will uh, be looking at trying to make a choice between preventing climate change or focusing on mitigation uh, to some extent, and also uh, uh, prioritizing uh, renewables and non-carbon-based uh, sources of energy uh, versus funding of further climate uh, investigation and focusing on localities and regions as opposed to you know bigger the bigger picture. Uh, so perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Fellows, maybe you'd like to start uh, answering how you would prioritize those things. Well, in terms of observations, whether you're doing mitigation or adaptation, you, you need observations. For mitigation, you'll be monitoring the carbon levels to see if you're achieving them. For adaptation, it's more about uh, what about the processes that we need to understand to adapt to. So it, it was uh, last year in 2007, the National Research Council actually produced a study that laid out all the missions that uh, observational missions you need to take all the vital signs of the United States, and there are 17 of them. And even in the document that I provided in my testimony, out of the $9 billion, those that fall in the next five years are, are funded. So we have a very good road map of what kind of observations we need for both mitigation and ad adaptation. Mr. Chairman, if you if you'd allow the other witnesses to answer the same question, mm -hmm. they wish. Okay. No, one of the um, issues that I'd like to bring forward is that we're talking an awful lot about energy generation, but there's a tremendous amount we can do with conservation as well. And that also, and we can do that immediately. Um, interior lighting takes up 20 percent of the electricity that's in the grid today. And, by, and we're still using an incandescent bulb, which is basically a heater uh, that gives off light as a byproduct. There are other sources. In the automotive domain, we can do hugely better. So these are very quick responses that we can actually implement within a matter of a few years, and that will really, I think, change also the growth of carbon in the atmosphere at a, at a real rate. And we should never take our eye off the ball of conservation. There is a lot of solutions there. Thank you. Can I just add a little bit of reflection about um, energy research? We are talking about funding energy research and ramping it up very rapidly. I would just add a caution that we should not be too clever. There are a lot of technologies that are almost in reach, and you know, we very much want to move those along and get them implemented. But I believe that one of our government's major responsibilities and one of the important reasons why we have done so well in so many new industries is that we have invested in basic research, the kind of research where when you embark on it, you don't know what is going to come out of it. There will be new technologies coming along in the future only if we invest in basic research today. So let's, um, you know, while I am very enthusiastic about funding research that will deliver technologies for tomorrow and five years and ten years from now, we have got to be thinking about what we need to put in place so that we are funding the technologies 50 years from now. And that has been the brilliance of, frankly, DARPA, um, the NIH, in funding early research that no one could have predicted exactly where it was going to come out that has been so important for um, the nation's success. 
A critical part of the story that we have to come back to again and again is that even if we get to this 10 times increase in the federal money, which is our, certainly the goal that our papers of my lab have cited, it's going to be the private sector investment, far many times that, that we're going to need. To do that, we need to send a number of signals that this area is both stable, as we've described, but also we have opportunities now to help balance this field out. A number of states have adopted so-called loading orders, benefiting clean energy, energy efficiency, and the low carbon sources before they would authorize new fossil fuel production. That sends a strong signal. A number of other utility areas have engaged in a process of decoupling the revenues from more electricity sales with their overall profits based on a, a, a mechanism that allows a forecast of sales and the amount you get paid per kilowatt hour to vary to hit that target. That encourages conservation. It encourages low carbon forms of energy. So we have a number of mechanisms that aren't going to be seen as strictly research spending that can dramatically expand the industry's interest, ability, and rewards for going to the clean area. And that's really why, at the, at, the, at the legislation level, we critically need to tie these at all points back and forth. One last point on this is that we have effectively frittered away the last 20 years or so of knowledge of the climate change story. The details are still coming in, but the basic story has been known for some time. And many of these technologies have been ready to go. We need to pull on the market as well as pushing on, on the research side. And many of those market pulls do not require dramatic amounts of added money. Some do, like a better grid. But coupling clever policy tools and this much expanded R&D base really does send the signal that industry needs to make this a new national priority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> gentlemen's time has expired. What I'm going to ask now is for each of you to give us your best minute and a half summary of what you want the Congress to remember uh, about this issue uh, as we move forward uh, in putting uh, solutions in place. And we'll go in reverse order. Uh, we'll begin with you, Dr. Fellows. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, from our perspective, uh, we really see this as civilization standing at a serious crossroads. We, we have uh, a lot of uncertainties that are, we're facing. Uh, Mr. Hall, I, I've sat with Sandy McDonald before and looked at that large globe in, in NOAA. One of the big concerns we have are, are helping local and re regional decision makers deal with energy issues, with water, with food issues and to reduce some of the uncertainties. Another really scary one is the civilization has been putting about six or seven gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. There are thousands of gigatons of carbon frozen in the Arctic. As the, as the Arctic heats up, and it will heat up quite a bit more than the rest of the world, how quickly will that be released? If it's released quickly, it could be the end of civilization. That's a kind of uncertainty that we don't fully understand. I'm not saying it will happen, but we don't, we don't understand it. So the kind of uh, research investments that we're talking about in this community document addresses those type of issues. Thank you, Dr. Fellows. Dr. Kamen. First, energy is a $1 trillion industry in this country. We import $700 billion of that. And so what we're calling for <coughs> an increase here is a very small down payment, a very small brain trust to manage that huge industry. It is exactly in keeping with the amount of effort we would need in this area. And the fact that we do have such an important diversity of energy research topics and researchers ready to go should give every member of Congress and the Senate the motivation to stick with the plan to develop these carbon and energy plans and to bring them forth and to recognize that poll after poll of Americans says that clean energy and secure low carbon power is something that people want. They need the political leadership and they need the vision that this is going to be a plan. We lack that plan. We lack that go to the moon sort of uh, mentality right now. That's the vital lesson that will bring all of the science technology base broadly into the market. Thank you, Dr. Kamen. Uh, Dr. Forrest. To me, it's really just simply a matter of priorities. Um, as a nation, we have great wealth and we can set our priorities almost at will if we choose to. And I can't think of a higher priority. Everything is at stake here. Our national security, we are currently buying uh, our energy from our be least best friends in the world, primarily. It's a question of a clean environment. What are we leaving for our children? What are we leaving for 
generations to come. And finally, it's an issue of economic leadership and our standard of living. Really, it is the issue of the 21st century. If America does not seize this as a top priority, as perhaps the top priority, we will lose our position inevitably in the world, and it's going to happen very quickly. So I don't think that we have time to lose. I think that, uh, you know, responding just a wee bit to Mr. Inslee's question of where do we get the political heft to throw this forward, I think there is a rising uh, chorus of voices. Um, it may not hit today in, in full or, or even tomorrow, but it's got to hit within the next year or two, um, because if we don't set this as the priority, I can give you one example. Germany has set this as a national priority to get off of the uh, foreign oil uh, addiction and so on, and they have invested through their tax structures and so on in large growth in their solar industry. It's just one example, but they've set the priorities and they're on their way. We need to get on our way. Thank you, Dr. Forrest. And uh, Dr. Hockfield, you have a cleanup. So we've all articulated the deeply linked challenges of economic insecurity, energy insecurity, and global climate change. What we've been advocating for is a massive, powerful, important investment in research universities. These kinds of investments have a double return. We produce innovations and innovators. And what we're asking is please help us unleash the power of America's innovation economy to turn this global energy challenge into a wonderful energy opportunity. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. Well, thank you. It's our honor to have such a distinguished uh, panel. And, uh, and this is going to be a very important panel in terms of the information you have given us as we formulate uh, the plan uh, for January and February of 2009. We are clearly at a point where the debate for president is revolving around this issue. And as I said in my opening, drill baby drill is not a long-term strategy for the United States with 3 percent of the oil reserves. Uh, we need to unleash this technological genius. That's our strength. Uh, and that's always what has led to the United States being the dominant power in the world. And if we don't tap it, uh, then we will become ever more dependent upon those who not only are weak in technology, but are strong in our weakness. Uh, and that is something that ultimately, I think, can only be remedied by under unleashing all of the young people uh, that uh, at your universities you are finding want to solve this problem. So we thank each of you for being here today. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you didn't have to dash out either. So do you know uh, Mike?